So we'll go straight to the point. Uh, first of all, I must warn you that this typical teaching of um, living consciously and dying consciously comes from the Nyingma lineage. So if any of you here are kind of biased, then you may leave the room. <laughs> Secondly, uh, in order to be the audience of this class, you have to have kind of a completely different approach to what we call the life. I know that many of you come here to receive the Pardo teaching, and um, I don't know how it is in Singapore, but in many different places, the Pardo teaching is kind of popular. One of the reasons why people treat this as a popular uh, or kind of special teaching is because they think that this is a met this is a teaching uh, basis on how to die or what happens after the death. I may be wrong, but uh, I have a feeling that um, also here in Singapore, I have a feeling that many of you came here to hear about the death and uh, what will happen after the death and the procedure of the death when you hear that somebody is going to teach about the Pardo. So if you have such kind of expectation, then we are slightly going to a wrong track. Actually, the Bardo book, we are not talking about the death. As Chogyam Jungba Rinpoche wrote in his uh, commentary, of, uh, commentary to the Bardo teaching, um, we, should, we, may, we can actually call this teaching of Bardo not as a Tibetan book of the death, but book, Tibetan book of the birth. Um, I don't know whether you have heard this, uh, whether you are familiar with this Egyptian book of the death. Uh, but um, do you have any um, special, I mean, book of the death in Chinese culture? Any? Nothing? Nothing? Hmm. Maybe. Anyway, uh, book, like uh, Egyptian, Egyptian book of the death. Again, here, we should not uh, think that the Bardo teaching is Bardo teaching, although it is translated by uh, many of the ancient translators as Tibetan Book of the Death, we, we should not think that this Tibetan Book of the Death is going to talk about uh, what will happen after the death, such as uh, temperature or the uh, footprints of the uh, dying person or already dead person. Now, earlier I was talking about a different approach. Uh, you, the audience of this class needs to have a different approach. Didn't I say that? Now, this different ap approach, now, if you were to ask what kind of different approach, we are not talking about different kinds of prostrations or different kind of seating arrangements here. You have to have a completely uh, different types of psycho psychological, you know, state, or uh, you have to have even a different... Mm, you have to be. You have to be in the state where you can be able to nominate everything, uh, kind of a completely a different way uh, from what we usually do. Normally means you know, our day-to-day -day life. Um, for example, uh, it might help from. How long this teaching is going to last? Five days or something? Is it? Five days, right. So, even though you can't do it every day, you know, at least for these five nights, maybe it will help if you think. For example, like when you go to bed, instead of thinking that you are going to sleep, you, you should think that I'm going to be awakened. And um, when you get up in the morning, instead of thinking that, ah, I woke up, you should think that I'm now getting into the deep sleep and I'm now beginning to dream. You, you see, this is just one gross example here. Although it might cause some accidents, you know, here it may, uh, you know, be advisable to think left to right and right to left, things like that, you know, all upside down. You see, you need to have, you know, atmosphere is so important. I noticed that many of the uh, people, who, uh, maybe in, especially in Singapore, when they go to the centers, and when it is an initiation time, maybe a highest yoga tantra initiation, then people make a very special atmosphere, kind of, uh, you know, um, 
blissful, devotional, um, ritualistic, a little bit of dharma chaos. So all this atmosphere brings you into a state where you think that after receiving such initiation, you have become some sort of a different thing. Not necessarily better or worse, but you have gained something, you see. When you go to the teachings like Paramita teachings or emptiness teachings, then the atmosphere is very dull. <laughs> Here, in this class, we need a special atmosphere. And for this, we need to think that we are already dead. And we are actually floating here and hanging around in this state of Pardo. Only through this you may have some chance to learn what is Pardo. So as I was saying uh, between uh, what, um, uh, as I was saying earlier, what you do with a, a waking state and a sleeping state, you should think that you are dead now and that the death that we normally talk about, you know, the death that we normally talk by ordinary people is actually the state that which we can be alive out of our you know countless habitual patterns which we have collected for thousands and millions of lifetimes we always we have this tendency to think that life is to live is something positive and to die is something negative now here again we have to change this to live is something horrible Oh, not like on uh, some of, uh, not like uh, when you are, n I'm not telling you that you should have this, this attitude of um, broken-hearted people, you know. <laughs> you know, some broken-hearted people may think, that, oh, what's the point of living <laughs> if uh, she or he is not mine, yeah. you see. <laughs> Actually, when you talk like that, what's the point of living if she or he is not mine or if I can't be his or her, then you are not talking about uh, you know, um, renunciation of this life. You are actually talking about uh, an, a strong attachment to this life, not only to this life of yours, but the life of some other people whom you want to possess. Death has never been a negative. Without the death, there is no life. It is almost like we should say, it is almost thanks to the death that there is a life. As the saying goes in the Tibetan society, without the separation, there is no value of friendship. Without the death, you will, one will never appreciate life. Mm -hmm. Not only that, the death, we always think that death is something which comes much later. Or rather we think that the death is something that comes at the end of the living. And with our ignorance, we always think that we are yet to live. I am yet to settle down, yet to build house, yet to migrate. Mm -hmm. All this and lots of yet to, yet to, you know. But you see, the death has been always there. To, re to relatively, if you are quite intelligent person, and if you analyze, the only time that you can actually call that I am alive is the first moment when you're born. Because from then onwards you are dying all the time. Uh, we again, because of this ignorance, we never notice these things. From no tooth to the tooth. And from tooth to losing the tooth. <laughs> from no hair to hair and from to losing the, the hair. From crawling to stand up, standing up, and almost crawling. So One has once been a baby, a youngster, a man, woman, old, father, mother, son. One, one is now becoming grandfathers and grandmothers. Sooner or later one will become great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmothers. It doesn't matter. We still think that we are yet to live. If we go to the cemeteries, there's so many dead people. But one said we think that we are the, the you know, permanent, unbreakable, indes indestructible, like a Vajra. You know? If we see the change of different seasons, change of the Singapore itself, there's lots of impermanence message. So, so, so this, by knowing such things, one should think that dying is always there. So one can say that this teaching of Bardo is actually how to appreciate the death. You know, in Buddhism, many people think that Buddhism is a religion that denies the pleasure, that it denies the, all this beauty of the world. Buddhism tells you to go to cave, and you, Buddhism tells you to destroy this, destroy that, renounce this, renounce that. But these teachings that tells you to renounce this and that is very, very common teachings 
for those who has a very thick dualistic mind, for them they ha there has to be a difference between what is good and what is bad. For a disciple of superior faculties, Buddhism teach you to appreciate everything, nothing to be not to appreciate. You know, you know there has been a lot of questions about why this Vajrayana talk about uh, Vajrayana allows the people to eat meat. Many people ask me this question. Well, I say that I eat meat because I have no compassion. I'm breaking the rule of Mahayana. And many of the Vajrayana students who eat eat Minayana, what me, uh, meat? Uh. They are all being bad boys, you know. Because Buddha said not to eat meat in the Mahayana Sutra, especially. Now, in the Vajrayana, Buddha didn't say you have to, you can eat meat. There's no such kind of allowance, or there's no such as such kind of permission that was given in the Vajrayana. Actually, to really, you know, if you really study, and if you think it very carefully, the practice of Vajrayana, which, you, which allows, you, not really allows, but which you can eat meat, and the practice of Mahayana, which you cannot eat meat, in between these two, I would say, properly speaking, the Vajrayana's practice of uh, eating meat is much more difficult than um, Mahayana's uh, way, Mahayana's practice of not eating meat. Because in the Vajrayana, what they are saying is that a Vajrayana practitioner should not have any difference or a preference of the food. In, the, in ancient India, uh, meat is supposed to be really dirty. You know? I don't know whether you have read the uh, commentaries on the Gana Chakra Puja, but in it it says that if, you know, you, a Vajrayana practitioner should not make any difference if somebody offer you a beautiful, you know, a delicious a food and a shit together. You should take it both. So, you know, as you can see, sometimes the freestyle is much more dangerous than, uh, you know, non-freestyle, you see. If you do, if you have some kind of a preference, and if you sort of deny the dirty one, then you are breaking the Vajrayana vow at the time. Ah, where will be? This is not, this is not on the right track, okay? I, 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 I'm talking something different. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? We didn't start. Oh my goodness! What time is it? Oh yes, that's right. How to appreciate everything? That's very important in Buddhism. Huh? So here, as I was telling before, here you all, all of you came here because you heard that I was teaching Bardo. Let's say how to appreciate the death. But before we go on talking about how to appreciate the death. How much of us here appreciate the life? Many, not many of us really appreciate this living. Okay, so the Pardo teaching is actually not only the teaching of how to appreciate the death, but it is how to appreciate the living. So that's why the, our title here, the teaching, the title of this teaching is Living Consciously and Dying Consciously. Now as usual, when I give this, this is my third Pardo teaching in my whole lifetime. I'm still not good at this. Anyway, as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as I always do, I like to ask one question. Uh, this question will come tomorrow again, but I will ask to a different people. And I want an honest answer. Uh, not, a, not this, uh, you know, influenced by Buddhist kind of answer. I'm already expecting some kind of an influence by Buddhist answer from Prof Professor Wong. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, the question is a very easy one. Now, let's say you are going to die day after tomorrow, uh, day after the day after tomorrow, and we and this we know definitely. So you only have two more days to live in this world. You only have two days, okay? Imagine that. Okay, um, and what, what would you do? You would be ready, de you would be desperate? Very good answer, huh? Any else, anything else? <laughs> hmm? Confused and desperate. Julie, how about you? You will be very frightened. And what, are you very strict about what? Or what, I mean, tell me some of your uh, unusual personal. Uh, like, uh, are you very strict? Are you very uh, particular what you wear? Anything particular, tell me? Anything? 
Are you sure? Are you that careless kind of person? <laughs> so it won't work with him, huh? How about her? How about her? Anything? Particular food that you don't like? That you like very much? Particular food that you like very much? Particular thing that you like very much? Music, whatever. Friends, house, shows. Mm -hmm. Yes? Come on. Nothing good? Nothing what? Nothing? Are you, are you, do you feel resen, uh, you know, resentment towards uh, different attitudes? W would you get kind of annoyed if uh, somebody, if, while you are driving in the highway, if somebody cut you, you know? Would you get annoyed? Y you would get annoyed. And w would you get more annoyed if that driver scolds you back think, uh, saying that it's your fault? You, would you? Okay, now the question is, you are dying after two days, right? And it doesn't matter whether this person scolds you or not, whether this person cuts you or not, but would you still get angry or not? Are you sure? Your habitual patterns is strong, you know. <laughs> okay, let's say, pardon? You just don't care. Are you sure? I would get angry. Okay, let's say, let's say, do you have any particular habit, hab, uh, habitual patterns? Like you wake up and then you do exercise and then you have, um, you eat your breakfast and everything has to be like that. You know, some people have this system, systematic habitual patterns for a day-to-day -day life, right? And, you know, you go to the bathroom and you pick up the red uh, what, toothbrush, you put uh, only uh, one kind of a brand of uh, what, toothpaste, and things like that, huh? Would you care if you have only two days? Or would you still like to... Or would you feel careless? Would you brush your teeth? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question, huh? Would you brush your teeth? Come on, <laughs> you, you ask now. Pattern will change. Are you sure? Think it very carefully. Be honest. Okay, let's say in, in these two days, your best friend, you know, whom you invited for a dinner, last dinner, last supper, okay? And this, this person annoyed, uh, kind of sort of ignore you, saying that, oh, no, I can't come because I need to go to see a movie or something like that. Would you get hurt? Okay, I ask the same question. What would you do if you only have two days to live? Within these two days, what would you do? Yum? I kind of noticed that. <laughs> yeah, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, two days left, and you always lead a meditation, don't you, here? You are one of the coordinators here in this center, right? And which day is that? Tuesday, right. And your day is Tuesday and... Okay, Monday and Tuesday. That is the only two days you, you have, right? So your last day is Tuesday, and you have to go to the center to do this, your routine thing. <laughs> and actually, do you remember what is your routine thing? Anti-frantic meditation. <laughs> what? No. No. So, okay, let's say, with your, with your very dedicated mind, you came, okay? With your dedicated mind, you came. And surprisingly, usually there is not so much people coming to anti-frantic meditation. Maybe, let's say, only four. <laughs> but surprisingly, there was a, uh, Stephen called you and said, Jam, there's about 20 people waiting for your meditation instruction. So with your dedicated mind, you came, right? And in a, on the way, there was a traffic jam or something, and then you were already 45 minutes behind. Would you get excited or you, would you get worried? You only have now how many? About 20 hours to live. Because the next day you are dying, you see. You will eat better food or maybe you will eat better food? You will treat yourself more nicely? Okay. Um, Chachin, uh, I'd like to ask the question, same question to you. What would you say? Why, why you will be happy? Why you will be happy? Where is it? 
Raise it. I hope not Jurong Bad Park. <laughs> Otherwise you will have to spend fifteen years eating nuts, you know. <laughs> what is it? Chachin? I didn't hear you. What why what what is the reason that you'll be happy? I see. Oh, that's kind of good, huh? And uh, what would you do? I, now I'm run out of the names, you know, I'm sorry. I only know a few names. Um, what you would, would you do, a lady? Yeah, yeah. What would you do? You don't know. Oh, that's quite a good answer, huh? Actually, I also don't know what to do. <laughs> that's a good answer, yeah. That's a good answer, huh? And how would you? David? Mm-hmm. Then? I would do that. Yeah, then? Chachin, I want to ask you one more. Now, suppose you have a choice. You have a choice to, choice of, okay, let's say you only have two days to live, right? But someone, someone, someone came and said, okay, Chachin, you have a choice. You can actually die earlier. You know, what would you say? Would you like to die earlier or would you like to die just you you want to have two days? Doesn't matter. But would you prefer would you prefer one day or two days? No 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 no. Give me the answer. This is like a courtroom, you know, you have to have a <laughs> one day or two days. One day or two days, Chachin? Pardon? <laughs> what? Anything. <laughs> Stephen? Okay, suppose someone came and tell you, you only have two days. No, he, right? he said two days. Two, you said two days, but suppose someone came and say, actually, you can extend one more day. Would you like to? <laughs> Would you like that? <laughs> no. Are you sure? Be, be honest, be honest. Be honest, would you like to extend one more day? Are you sure? Because I would not like to extend one more day, because it will be terrible. Every minute it will be like an experience of a one lifetime. Because you have this horrible death coming soon. Anyway, this question I should ask someone else here. Mm, maybe you, Michael. That two days, will it, for you, will it be very, very, very long kind of experience, or two days will go so fast? Long, long one. So you, so you will not like to extend, not for one, one day. Not additional minute. How about one month? <laughs> you may have time. You, know. <laughs> you can consider. Oh, I don't think. Okay, you can consider. <laughs> you have some plannings to do. Okay, now go back to the teachings. <laughs> no. So, now, these questions that I have asked you can be not true. I hope that we will live more than two days. But even though, you know, I ask this question now, even though we all, even though we talk about it, during we discuss about it at this moment, like what will happen after two days? What will you do? Somewhere behind there, in us, there is a very, very blind confidence that it won't happen. So that's why I insist you to give me the honest answer, but honest answer will be quite difficult to arise because we are just entertaining ourselves at the moment, talking about the death. It would help if you, from now on, every day, maybe every week, maybe every month, make a date and think this two days business seriously. If, if it ever happens, okay, you see that the problem is that our death is uncertainty and this uncertainty of death has a, a good side and bad side. It has an advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is that 
you know, disadvantage is that we have to be in the fear, in the, you know, constant fear that when will it come. But the advantage is that we have this blind confidence that it won't happen. Now, if you can manage to, okay, let's say, let's say it, this comes really true that you really know someone, someone very special, speci- uh, you know, specialist in death tells you that, okay, you are going to die in, on a certain day. Then we may begin to, then this student, I mean, this person is a perfect student of a Pardo teaching. This, um, and this is a little bit of my experience because when I talk with uh, people, normal people like us, and when I talk with, uh, in the United States, I went to, um, and Australia, uh, I have friends and I went to uh, some of the AIDS patients. And uh, when I talk with them, it's different. You see? So I would say those people who have AIDS, so, yeah? For example, they are actually living consciously. We think that they are dying, but they are actually the person who live consciously. And people like us, who are supposed to be sober, intelligent, you know, we are actually uh, living unconsciously and dying consciously. Whether we have AIDS or no, no, you know, whether we don't have, it doesn't matter. You know, we have to die. Tonight you may never see your bedroom. Uh, I have a friend um, in Australia. She's very young. She's uh, very intelligent. She's in the uh, universities studying. Very intelligent. Very you know energetic. And today I'm receiving a call that she's uh, in coma and she's under the what um, life supporting system. Bar uh, actually means means in between in in Tibetan. And Do is some kind of a space or a place, the place that comes in between. Now, then we start Pardo. Now, what is Pardo? Now, to understand, okay, before we go through detailed explanations on the Pardo, there's a four different stages of Pardo that we speak. The natural Pardo of this life, 第一个呢, the luminous part of dharmata, the karmic part of becoming. No, as I read these categories, this must tell you that we are not only talking about a death. Although many people think that Bardo teaching is a teaching that is only for the dead person. Maybe ten minutes break. Ten minutes of Bardo. Now, in many texts, are we ready? Okay. In many different texts, Bardo uh, is explained in many different c- categories. Normally, the, the bardo is taught into six different categories. Uh, on the top of the four um, category that we just talked, um, bardo of dream and bardo of meditation. <coughs> so four plus two is six, isn't it? Is it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, in this text, the bardo of meditation and bardo of dream is included in the natural bardo of this life. Now, when we talk about, uh, when we go through the, the definition of bardo, which is in between, you know, the space in between, actually, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche again have a, mm, uh, he has a very good uh, term, term here. I think it's quite good. Uh, he calls it a gap. Gap, like the you know the fashion, the gap. Pardo <coughs> uh, teaching is a teaching of a gap. So, in order to create a gap, we need three entity, something on the right and something on the left, or something on the top or on the bottom, and then you can create the gap, right? Or maybe in between the past and future. So we always need a two entity, even though you know. You, you see, the Buddhism, you know, as Buddhism, the teaching of Buddha travels into different countries. The different countries, their own habitual, uh, you know, patterns uh, contributed. So therefore, you see all these ritualistic, uh, what, um, ritualistic things. Otherwise, as you can find in the Bardo teaching, the Buddha Dharma or the teaching of the Buddha is an explanation of the situation explanation of the life, explanation of so-called living and dying. This is like an example, okay? Normally, 
a Buddhist practitioner always study about the right and left, like study of karma, for example. What have you done in the past? Don't do this, otherwise you will become something bad in the future. So it's a study of a past or a study of a future, or a study of right or a study of left. So here these brilliant teachers, they have created, they have invented, not exactly invented, they have, you know, given us, they have blessed us with this teaching of gap, which has got nothing to do with the past and the future, but which has got to do with a gap, or in between, or the now, nowness, or the presentness. The students who, has, who have been into my um, last year, was it, in the warriors, warriors uh, training, or warriors teaching last year, two years before, I'm sorry, two years before, you know, two years ago, I, we had a discussion on the warrior training. For those who did this course, for them it would be easier for, to understand what I'm talking about, the presentness or the gap. Now, at that time we talk, I presented to you as presentness. Here we are talking, I, w I will not use this presentness, but instead I, w I would use gap. M meaning is almost the same. So when we talk about the first part of the part of natural, about the natural part of this life, again we have to fit with this definition of in between, you know. So in between what? When we talk about natural part of this life, this life is the gap, and this gap is in between two entities again. You see. So which are they? If we were to ask this question from the moment you were, you came out from the mother's womb, from the moment the eggs cracked, anyway, you know, from the moment what you call the birth happened, till a time or a stage where you are sure to die, or where, where you are being possessed or caught by a cause and condition of death, without any antidote. 